Good morning. Welcome to session three of the Fifth Dole Institute of Politics uh, post-election conference. I'm Bill Lacey, the director of the Dole Institute. A couple of very quick announcements. Please turn off your cell phones if you've turned it back on during the break. You know how we do the Q&A. We'll have a couple students uh, walking around getting, uh, bringing uh, cordless mics so you can uh, ask panelists questions. Um, I am going to, to save time for discussion. Uh, since I believe our group is largely who we had in the previous session, I'm going to dispense with going around and introducing all of our guests, and I'm going to go directly into the content on this session. But I want to thank all of our, our panelists for being with us or for being part of a, a really outstanding two-day <coughs> post-election conference. A couple weeks back, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer astounded a number of us by offering the following. Quote, unfortunately, Democrats blew the opportunity the American people gave them. We took their mandate and put all of our focus on the wrong problem, health care. Senator Schumer, correct. Was he correct? <laughs> from, from a moral perspective or from a political, political perspective? Political, political. And I think that's an important distinction. I mean, a lot of the blow up has been, well, we, you know, seven million more people have health insurance or whatever. And that's an important factor. You know, you don't just get elected to get elected the next time around. You get elected to do stuff. And if you're a Democrat, health care reform is like the thing you get elected to do. Um, but from a, from a political standpoint, I think he was actually uh, spot on. I mean, you look at uh, Obama, Obama was being compared to FDR a lot in 2008, 2009. You look at what FDR did. He comes in, he has 100 days, and it's just like boom, 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 one thing after the another that all have to do uh, with the economy, uh, he, you know, the, 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 the Banking Act, well, the, the, the bank holiday and the Banking Act, the it, AAA, um, you know, it, and it, it culminates in the, uh, I can't remember the alphabet soup now, but, uh, and, and he doesn't do some stuff like Social Security until 1935 after he's already had a solid midterm election, the economy is clearly improving. Then he starts moving to things like that in the Fair Labor Standards Act. With Obama, it was like he had taken the uh, FDR's 100 days, put it in a single thing called the stimulus, passed it on the first day, and said, okay, let, let's do health care now. Uh, it's a completely different tack from what FDR did. I think if, if Democrats, I think the smart play for Democrats would have been to break up the stimulus into three or four or five bills that get passed over the course of it so that the focus is on everything Democrats are doing for the economy. Maybe do the tax cut bill first because I don't think you would have gotten uniform Republican resistance to a standalone tax cut bill as the first act of the Congress. Then you do an unemployment insurance bill, then you do infrastructure spending. Just If, if it's just this kind of one thing after the other, you really do establish the narrative that the Democrats are, are focused like laser beams on the economy. And if things haven't turned around by July or August, I mean, I, I think you, you have to try to do a second stimulus instead of health care reform. Because if the economy doesn't improve or isn't perceived as improving, you're going to have, you're going to lose 63 seats in the House. I, I guess just to, I agree with Sean uh, in terms of the distinction. Uh, politically, it was not popular, obviously, for them to pursue health care. At the same time, they had what I haven't seen, which is the White House, House, big House majority, and a super majority in the Senate. And you run for big majorities to do big things. And they decided that the big thing they wanted to do was health care. I think a lot of, I covered enactment of the bill. And a lot of Democrats at the time said, hey, this is, this is, we're going to feel pain on this politically for five years, but in 10 years, Republicans are going to be running on components of the law. I don't know if that latter part is true, but I think there was an acknowledgment at the time that this was a political sacrifice that they were making to do something big, something they had wanted to do since the 30s. And they, you know, you can, uh, and they got more of what they wanted than I think a lot of us, when the process started, thought that they could. Um, but there was obviously a big uh, political downside, and I think the party is still reeling from it. Yeah, and I, and I to add to that, I would just say, like, look, we we've, we've some, seen some exit polls that indicated that uh, voters who whose top issue was the health care split 59, 39 for for Democrats. Um, but you know, I think it's still a little bit too early to tell, uh, and that's why you know at the DNC we've organized a very diverse. Uh, task force to ensure that uh, you know we best serve our constituents and we also serve our candidates to see if this in fact was truly one of the big 
big issues that uh, was, was a determining factor in the outcome of the election. I think the one thing that was missing from what Senator Schumer had to say was exactly what the rest of that economic agenda would have been and how they would have been able to get it passed. Um, you know, they, they barely passed the, you know, well, they, they passed the stimulus with no Republican votes, and it was clear not that long after that they weren't going to be able to go back in for a second bite at that apple because there was not going to be the political will uh, to do it. And so, um, you know, the president clearly made a decision against the advice from time to time of some of his advisors to go for the entirety of health care rather than the smaller pieces as Rahm Emanuel and some others were advising when things looked tough at different points. Um, but for the reasons Patrick said, I think it was the president's conclusion that we're either going to get this now or we're not going to get it. Um, I'm not sure that Senator Schumer was a great opponent of that at the time. <laughs> um, in retrospect, it's easy to say we should have done more or said more about, about the economy. Um, and, and Sean, I mean, I think your point is well taken, but in the context of that moment, um, breaking up that bill into individual pieces, I think, was uh, to everybody involved in it, uh, not worth the risk of letting the economy go, you know, even farther down, even faster down. I mean, I think that there was a, a feeling that they had to do something to try to shock the system back to life, uh, that, you know, that, that they were starting out to try to make sure that the deep recession didn't come a, become another depression. So, um, you know, it, 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 again, we're, you know, we're a long way from that period, but, uh, but the, the people in the middle of that were, were absolutely frightened about the potential consequences of where the economy was heading. Uh, and having done what they did, there just wasn't a lot of gas left in the tank in terms of other ideas about what to do other than increase spending dramatically, which they weren't going to be able to do. You know, I, I, it's, the campaign, whether you focus on economics or you focus on health care, bottom line is for the average person, your policies have to work. And if your policies don't work and make <coughs> things better, then you're going to have a hard time running regardless of whatever you're talking about and, and more to the skill of the politician like I, I would think of President Obama getting reelected in 2012 his political skills than the actual thing that the economy is getting better. He may have saved, bottomed out, but going back to like when Bill and I would remember, you know, uh, uh, in 1984 did a uh, post-election survey and the number one thing why Ronald Reagan got reelected was not that he was a conservative, that was number two, but it was the economic recovery. And, and after that, number three was that he made America stronger. And my clients were like, oh, he won because he was conservative. I said, no, if his policies had failed, he would have lost. And I think with Senator Schumer, like when you get into the detail of his speech, he starts talking about e income inequality and government this and government that. I don't think those policies will work. And that's maybe what the next election is going to be about because you're going to have to talk about economic growth. You're going to have to talk about some sort of positive, optimistic message. But the bottom line is the American people will get behind something they think is going to work, and then when you're up for re-election, if it hasn't worked, you're in trouble. And whether it's health care, the health care issue was a problem because the policy, you may talk about 7 million getting insured, but there's people losing health care. And, and when we take our surveys, there's more people saying their premiums have gone up, they're afraid of losing their health care, I can't see my doctor, it's not working. And even Democrats are admitting it's not working. So now on economics, why would you double down on I don't care if stimulus bill's broken up or not. It didn't work. And, it, and, and right now these economic policies aren't working because you may say unemployment's at 5.8, 5.9, but uh, U6, which is people have left the workforce or people working part-time, it's, it's almost 12 percent. So, you know, we can talk about all the clever strategies you want, but people, they don't get fooled. And especially in Kansas, they won't get fooled. If things aren't good, you'll pay the price of the election whether you're Republican or Democrat. If things are, things are good, you'll be rewarded. Okay. Just, just a quick thought, uh, follow up on what Dan said. And I want to say that this is a thought. I've, I've written this stuff up before, and I think there are maybe three people that agree with me. So <laughs> the, this, the, 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 he has by far the majority opinion on this. So these are my thoughts, not, not firm things. But, but on the question of, you know, could they have done a second stimulus? I mean, I, I think if you can get that health care bill passed after Scott Brown gets elected, you could get a second stimulus done. I mean, that, that health care bill, by the time it was at the end, looked like a kamikaze run, and they, they did it anyway. And I, I also think, you know, they actually did pass about $200 billion more in stimulus money over the course of that Congress that no one heard about 
just small bore bills that added up to a lot of money because everyone was talking about health care reform, the HELP Act, and, and you, can, you can run down the litany. Um, as for breaking it up, I, want, I think one of the biggest problems with the stimulus wasn't the, the, this wasn't the economics of it, it was the design of it. Um, I, I don't know, if you go back and read, I mean, a, a, some huge portion of the stimulus wasn't going to be spent until 10 years down the road, at which point it, it wasn't stimulus, it was just a spending bill. Um, I, I think if you want to make the first bill something other than tax cuts, you make it the actual stimulus that was spent in 2009, an emergency spending bill like they did in the New Deal, actually. Um, you know, the, I think it was like $150 billion gets spent in 2009. So you put that up front, so that money's going into the economy. And then you're like, okay, here's tax cuts over the next three years that we're spending. And here's, um, you know, unemployment. And, and then you start running it down, the Medicare, the Medicaid money that's in the stimulus. And then you just kind of have this snowball effect. And I, I also think that has, you know, to the extent that our economy is motivated by animal spirits, to kind of get into to Keynes, I, I think that has an effect on people to see government say, okay, we're doing this and now we're doing this and doing this and it, it builds up as opposed to just having this big glob called the stimulus that Republicans can just sit and take pot shots at. Um, it's one thing to run against the stimulus, it's another thing to run against the $400 billion tax cut bill as a Republican. I, I, without getting into a bait about the uh, specifics or the policy or what the stimulus looked like, I do as a part-time congressional reporter, I think that it was kind of this defining moment that we often overlook because it became such a partisan fight. I never would have thought that Eric Cantor could have gotten every Republican to vote against that thing. I'm sure the makeup of it mattered, but because they set that precedent, it just changed the entire dynamic. I mean, if you take yourself back, there are two million people on the mall or a million people on the mall all there to see Barack Obama. I mean, he was as popular a uh, new president as we have ever elected. And, you know, here we are a couple weeks later, or not even in that same moment, uh, for, for whatever reason, the Republicans all decide to vote against the thing. And it just, it like, for the rest of that Congress, it became a total black or white fight. You know, you're, I'm on one side or I'm on the other. And uh, I don't want to point fingers at one side or the other, but uh, it just, it's, it, 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 fund, it was like fundamentally changed the way Congress worked, and I don't feel like Congress has really gone back ever since. Yeah. And, and I, if I could, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I got to see it firsthand working when I was at, at HUD, at Housing and Human Development, what the stimulus actually did. And I think right now, I think it's still a little bit too early to actually see exactly what, is, what how it affected the economy and, 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 and how it's going to affect it long term. But I will say that um, in what working at, the, uh, at HUD, as I mentioned, um, you know, we were able to, to get money to homeowners that uh, were going to, their houses were on the verge of being foreclosed on. Uh, and it, had it not been for HARP and had not been for a number of different uh, programs that we um, had for it because of the stimulus, uh, these, these folks would have been on the streets. Um, so we were able to help uh, people stay in their homes, keep families together. Uh, and I think uh, that was the real, for me, the real humanistic part of the stimulus and how that actually affected people. And you could see that, and it was really tangible. Okay. On the housing program, because that's a good example of the, there were a lot of things that the administration did that did not get a lot of coverage. They created these programs for the housing market to try and bail people out who are either underwater in their loans or just marginally struggling. Do you guys think that it had the impact that you wanted it to have? And also, do you think you could have done a better job of selling voters on uh, what was in there and how it actually was ha helping? Because we write about these things all the time at the Wall Street Journal. I don't know that you hear about them on the campaign yeah. trail. No, uh, uh, you know, absolutely. I think it did uh, uh, help people. I mean, now in, in Las Vegas, you, you know, the, the uh, foreclosure rate is, is, is down. Uh, Florida, you know, the, the, the housing market has rebounded even in Colorado. So I think it did help. And proof of that is that uh, not only did we do the f one round, we did two rounds uh, of it to, uh, because it was such a huge success. Um, to your second part, um, I, I think that we could have done a, done a better job uh, from a messaging pr uh, perspective to say and actually get real people to actually talk to people to say this actually helped me stay in my home and kept my family together. Um, so yes, we could have done a better job. And, Maybe had we known each other previously, <laughs> I could have gave you those names. <laughs> or, or if it had been passed as the housing bill, not right. as a part of this blob called the stimulus. Um, and I, I think that would have made a difference in the messaging and the perceptions. Okay. 
Uh, let me ask another question. Uh, Republicans, I think most people would agree Republicans won more seats in the Senate than most folks expected. Uh, they were expected to lose governorships, actually picked up a couple governorships. They now have more House seats than any time since Herbert Hoover and more legislative seats than they've had since 1920. Does this mean anything? <laughs> Don't everybody talk at once. <laughs> I, I think it uh, shows a huge problem with the Democrats' new coalition. Uh, part of it is the midterm drop-off, which, you know, I, I read people saying, oh, it's just the midterm electorate, you know, it'll come back, and I'm like, well, is that it? I mean, so every, 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 other, every other election cycle, Democrats are going to get blown out of the water because their voters don't show up. Well, that's a problem. Um, but the other thing um, is that by focusing on young, urban, minority voters, you're focusing on a group of people who are geographically compact. They live in cities, or because of the Voting Rights Act, they live in minority-majority districts that you know, are required to put these voters together. Um, and so, what, now this doesn't explain governorships, but, but this explains a lot, I think, of what we've seen in congressional and state legislative races, which is that, you know, legislative races are geographically based. And if, you're, if you are in New York State, which, you know, 60-40 Obama state, uh, and you want to draw reasonably compact districts without drawing a district that stretches from Manhattan to Buffalo, um, by the time you get draw, done drawing three or four um, congressional districts on Manhattan, all of a sudden the rest of what's left over is like 52-48 Obama. And once you've done the Bronx and Queens and Brooklyn, you have a Republican-leaning state for the remember, remaining 15 uh, districts. And this is repeated in state after state over the country. It's not just gerrymandering, like actual gerrymandering, although that, that plays a role, but there's a couple of political scientists who have created an algorithm to create randomly drawn districts. Uh, and it turns out if, if our districts were generated completely randomly, there would be seven or eight fewer Republican-leaning districts than we see today, and that's it. Uh, you would still have a Republican skew to the map because of the geographical concentration of the Democrats' new coalition. Let me just uh, cite some other statistics to follow up on that. In 2012, uh, there are roughly 3,300 counties in this country, and the president won maybe 600 of them, or you know, relatively small number. But of the 39 counties with populations of one million or more, he won 35 of them. And he won those counties by 8 million votes. He lost the rest of the country by 3 million votes, 5 million votes. Uh, so the, the, the geographics of what we're doing is, is important, as, as Sean says. I did a piece a couple of <coughs> weeks ago right after the election in which I talked about some of this phenomenon, Bill, um, and, and said that the, the, the last midterms have essentially hollowed out the Democratic Party that if you look at what has happened in the governor's races, uh, if you look at what's happened in the states, not just in the state legislative races, but, but other statewide races, uh, the Democrats are at a very low ebb in terms of building a bench, building for the future. Um, you look at the congressional leadership of the Democratic Party at this point, and, and, and it, is, you know, it is an aging leadership. Um, Hillary Clinton's prospective presidential candidate for all the attributes that she will bring to that race, she is suppressing a generation of, uh, of younger Democrats from becoming national leaders or competing in a national environment. Uh, and I think the longer that kind of thing goes on, or, or in other words, the, the, it is incumbent on the Democrats to try to begin to reverse that. If you look at what happens in places where this is the norm, um, and Texas is one good example, um, the, the decline of the Democratic Party. I mean, obviously, Texas has has, be, has always been a conservative state, and, and southern states are, uh, in particular, where we've seen the Democratic Party wither on the vine. But there's been no investment in the Democratic Party. There's been an inability to find really good candidates, even when they found what they thought was a good candidate. This time, it didn't make much of a difference. So that's a red state. But then you look at Ohio, which we think of as a battleground presidentially, because it has been in recent years. I think my math is right. In five of the last six 
elections, um, Republicans have won every statewide race in, in that state. Uh, and so um, the Democrats have a longer term problem unless they are able to essentially regenerate and the way you begin to do that is you begin to do it through state legislative races and then you begin to do it by rising up uh, through uh, statewide races and then winning, you know, winning Senate and gubernatorial races. So uh, it, it, it is a problem. I mean, the longer this goes on, the more problematic it will be for the Democrats. Uh, yeah, I, I think, look, we, I agree with, with, with a lot of the stuff that you said <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I mean, we can evaluate, look at both parties, I think we can find, you know, an aging leadership in both sides, um, <laughs> if you, but, uh, you know, to, but, uh, you know, we're, we've, we've, we're taking a look at all of, all of, uh, you know, where we're at in terms of building the bench with this task force that we put together. Um, but I will say that we also do have, we do have some folks that are going, that are building the bench for us in states like Georgia with Stacey uh, Abrams, who's uh, the minority leader there, who has was is very active in Georgia and making sure that she's getting people re getting people registered to vote to make sure that the, that they're getting more Democrats elected. Um, you referenced, <coughs> excuse me, Ohio. Nina Turner, I think, was uh, was an interesting. Uh, we we really invested in her and making sure that we could uh, do as much as we can to get her elected Secretary of State. But she was just dealt a, a bad hand with the, with the governor's uh, situation, and and so that just affected her. But I think that. Um, you know, and, and investing in these candidates and in and, and now and then also um, kn knowing that we need to, to do a better job of doing it, I think it's going to be helpful and, and I think you're right. Um, and, you know, and if I might add uh, to another person that is, is uh, going to be a rising star within the Democratic Party as well, the Castro brothers are somebody that, uh, that are, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, that are going to do well. And we also have, uh, you know, Ben Ray Lujan who just was uh, um, appointed the uh, chairman of the the uh, DCCC. Um, so, you know, we do have a lot of work, absolutely, um, but I do want to, to say that we do have our, our candidates that we are focusing on. We do have uh, a bench that we are trying to build, and uh, again, with this task force, I think we're going to be able to come out with a lot of good um, functions and what we need to do uh, to make sure that 2016 is prosperous and then also making sure that we're going to be uh, doing well in midterms because we have seen in 2012 and 2014 what we've learned is that we are not um, and so I unfortunately took two cycles to, 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 to hit us upside the head, um, but, 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 we, but we got hit. So, so we're, we're, we're ready to make those changes and ready to, to uh, put that to task. But you know, it comes down to the candidates and messages. A lot of this we're talking about process and every campaign you come in and it's a mix of us, those of us who are the operatives, you got geography, you got ideology, you got demographics and you're building the coalition. And, and Bill, as you mentioned last night, you had the, uh, you know, the Kevin Phillips book where he was great, he wrote, there's a 28 to 32 year cycle where politics goes up and down and the coalitions, it's, it's been an amazing historical uh, trend in the United States where you have these presidential cycles and then you have the, the, the coalitions underneath it as the country changes. But what's really interesting was the Republicans were on an up cycle and, and uh, uh, in two, 2002, going into 2004, it was possible that we could have recreated a coalition. The big difference was in between 88 and uh, uh, 2000, we didn't have that foreign policy glue that kept, that, that kept the Republican coalition in place so that, so that the Jack Kemp, Pat Robertsons, uh, et cetera, could be within the same party because you were all anti-communists. Wall goes down, we lose our glue, Clinton becomes president, uh, the Perot of independence leave the party, and you get all this change, and then you come back into 9-11, you know, and, and uh, after that, the Republicans were again on the upswing, but Iraq was something that broke apart our coalition. And bottom line is it didn't work. The, 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 the et cetera, we go into Iraq and we, we're still living with today, but basically staying too long did not work. And, and you know, now what happened in this election was seeing the first signs of the Republican glue coming back together on those security issues and real concern about the Democrat policies. And there's real concern about still Americans are very insecure about um, economics where I mean literally I mentioned before China is now the world's largest economy and most Americans won't accept that we shouldn't be the second economy to them they may have a lot more people but why are they doing better than us and you know the message that people want that we got earlier in the year for Republicans when we're doing focus groups on the house side we're doing all these focus groups for 
YG Network and other stuff, they want economic growth again. They want hope, they want prosperity, they want America to be strong again, and they want policies to work. So the next round of leadership where you're looking at this presidential race, both sides are going to have their ideas about policies whether for whatever reasons, you know, the Democrats think raising the minimum wage makes us a lot stronger. Republicans think economic growth will make us a lot stronger. There's, that's what the debate's going to be about, and people are looking for hope, and that coalition will, will reconfigure based on, you know, I, I mean, right now the Republicans have done well when it's a midterm and it's a lower turnout. In the bigger turnout, we're going to have to motivate a lot more people to get into our coalition and with a leader that's capable of, of demonstrating that. Well, that really, uh, let me interrupt, that really sets up the next question I want to ask because it really sets up perfectly, and, and, and Sean, I want to start with you on this because Sean's done a lot of work and a lot of writing and written a book mm -hmm. about the subject of party coalitions and the ebb and flow of politics and, you know, is that, did it ever exist, does it exist kind of now? I'd like you to talk a little bit about your theory, but then I'd also like you and everyone else, because John said something that really hit a nerve with me, everyone else to relate to the issue, okay, was this election about midterm versus presidential turnout, or in this election, can we take a variety of factors that, 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 that raise their heads? We had the glue, the kind of this national security glue that I frankly had not thought of that John just mentioned. We had, uh, at least in some cases, greater a percentage of, of, of Hispanic vote for Republican candidate. We had greater percentages of young voters for uh, Republican candidates. And we seem to have, have, have seen a situation where white working class Democrats voted more Republican. So kind of speak to that broader issue of what's going to happen next based upon those factors. So, so I've probably written about 120,000 words on this over the course of my career, and if I said everything, it would take 20 hours. I just jotted down the math. Um, Go ahead. So I'll, I'll, try, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I, I don't buy realignment theory, um, the, the theory they teach you in Elections 101, that there are 36-year epicycles in 1828, 1860, 1896, 1932, 1968. I don't think it works. I, I think that it's like when you look at the clouds and you see figures in it, our brains are, pro are no, seriously, evolutionarily, we're, we're programmed to see patterns, whether they exist or not. And I think people look at the elections data and they want to see a pattern, and lo and behold, they, they find one. Um, and I, I think the best proof for this is if you go back to 1856, the first year that Republicans ran a presidential candidate, there have been 40 elections. And you can, you can do the math with the binomial equation that says, if, if our elections had been, well, if our elections had been governed by coin tosses, completely random, how many times would we expect to see Republicans or Democrats win three of 10 elections, let's say, or as the realignment theorists like to talk about, seven of nine elections, or, and you can go through all the possible combinations and figure out how many runs you should see. And in fact, the correlation between what we would expect to see and what we see is about 97%. Our elections, operate almost exactly as if they were governed by coin tosses. Now, they aren't governed by coin tosses, obviously, but the factors that, that play into elections, the fundamentals like the economy, scandals, wars, are more or less random and outside of the control of the parties. And so to kind of bring this in more concretely, you know, Democrats like to say, well, Republicans have won five of the last six, or have lost the, the popular vote in five of the last six elections. You hear that a lot. Well, which of those elections should Republicans have even had a chance of winning the popular vote? Not 1992, okay, when we were in a slow, slow economy. Certainly not 1996 at the start of the greatest peacetime election in history. Certainly not 2008 when the economy was contracting by 9% on election day. They probably shouldn't have even been in the game in 2000 when we were at the tail end of the greatest peacetime expansion in history. The only elections where the Republicans really should have had a shot of winning the popular vote were 2004 and 2012, and they split them. Now. The flip side, well, I'll say for Republicans who point to 1952 uh, to 1988, and I do think there's something to the idea that there was a three-legged stool of fiscal, social, and foreign policy conservatives, and the Cold War was the, the top of the stool that held it together. But which elections from 1952 to 1988 should the Republicans 
have lost. Not 1952 or 56 when you had Ike as your nominee. Not 1972 when there was massive economic growth. Not 1980 when the economy was contracting. Not 1984 when the economy was expanding at 7%. And not 1988 when the economy was growing at 4%. Um, all of the elections act exactly how we would expect them to act, just looking at the economy, scandals, and wars. Um, so I, I, I just, I don't think, I don't think there is a rhythm to history. I, I think it is short-term factors uh, that drive the elections. So, so what does this mean for where we go to the future? Um, because a lot of the discussion I think we'll probably have about this has to do with demographics. Um, and you know, the, 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 how much of this was drop-off? Uh, how much of this was persuasion in this last election? Well, you can do the math, and if there's zero persuasion at look, at work, the drop-off voters split 57-43 Democrat. Now, that is, that, that's not a huge amount. It's actually not old enough to flip very many of the Senate races. Um, and that also assumes zero, dem zero persuasion, uh, which, which I don't think is likely. I think it was a combination of demographic drop-off, but I think there was a massive amount of persuasion. And it's what we would expect when a president's job approval drops from 52% in the exit polls on election day in 2012 to 44%. <coughs> Um, on election day in 2014, and that drop-off is mirrored with adults as well. As to demographics, look, if demographics had really played a large role over the last six elections, the political science models that are based off of um, economic growth, wars, incumbency, should stop working, because there should be an extraneous factor that they don't account for that's driving this. And they don't, they continue to work. In fact, you can take Alan Abramowitz's time for change model, take the data for it up to 1988, cut off before the demographic changes really start, okay, and use that to predict 2012, and it predicts it perfectly. Um, so you can take all the data from before the demographic shifts and the electric start. And the reason is that there's been this explosion in the non-white share of the electorate, but whites have become more Republican, and it's basically canceled out. And this is what has happened time and time again after history. All these changes cancel out the coalition's shift, and we're left with Fundamentals. As to the future, African Americans, in a, there's a question of whether, that, whether the Democrats can sustain 13% of the electorate in the future. The other interesting thing, and this has been replicated in the last three or four polls, is that younger African Americans are actually about 10 points less Democratic than older African Americans. Um, this, is, this is in the exit polls, this is in recent Gallup polling, um, and, and this is in Another data set I can't think of off the top of my head, but, but that, that's not a huge change. It gets Republicans from 5 to 15 percent of African Americans, but that actually makes a, a one-point difference in the popular vote. And as for Hispanics, you know, Republicans need to win about a third of Hispanics to have a chance at the popular vote. They've done that in 1998, 2000, 2002, 2004, 2010, and 2014 with a variety of positions on immigration reform. Now, it may well be that the presidential electorate among Hispanics is just, uh, unless the GOP embraces immigration reform, the presidential electorate won't get behind them, but consider this possible alternative. In 2012, Republicans ran Mitt Romney. There's my explanation. He was a terrible candidate for, Hispan for outreach to <coughs> Hispanics who are younger and socioeconomically less well-off than Republicans. He was old, he was white, he looked like a stockbroker, the guy who had fired you in this recession. His running mate looked like the consultant who told Romney to fire you in the last recession. And on top of that, irrespective of his position on comprehensive immigration reform, which I wholeheartedly support, he made this comment that he was going to make life so miserable for Hispanics that their beloved abuela was going to turn around and self-deport herself. That is not the way to do Hispanic outreach, regardless of his position on comprehensive immigration reform. So I, I think the 27% in 2012 is just this massive combination of factors. I think comprehensive immigration reform plays a role, but I don't think it explains the anywhere close to the entirety of the difference between 40% among Hispanics in 2004 and 27% in 2012. And I don't think I was anywhere close to concise, but that's the outlines of my thoughts on no, this. No, actually, I thought that was pretty concise, John. Not John. <laughs> Other comments? I, I mean, I think demographic uh, turnout is, is, is extremely important, um, and <clears throat> we know that as a Democratic Party. I mean, we saw, and just so we can talk about, talk about Hispanic voters, um, Hispanic voters comprise 8% of the electorate this midterm, and Democrats won the majority of their support overall by 62%. Um, and 
Forty percent of Hispanic voters said that the Republican Party has now become so anti-immigrant and anti-Latino that it would be hard for me to consider supporting them. Uh, it was what they were saying according to Latino decisions. Um, and when asked about the issues, 78 percent of Hispanic voters favor raising the minimum, uh, federal minimum wage to 1010, and 77 percent of Hispanic voters in key states like Texas, Florida, Georgia, Kansas, and North Carolina said that states should expand Medicaid. And as it relates to African American black voters, um, nationwide, 89% of the black electorate voted for Democrats, uh, while only 10% uh, uh, supported Republicans, as you said, which is, is a good gain. And, and, uh, um, and you know, I commend the Republican Party for, for doing that outreach. Um, and then the women vote, Democrats have gained six points with women voters compared to 2012. Uh, according to the New York Times, 50% of women voted for Democrats compared to 47% voting for Republicans, and also young voters are continuing to support Democrats. So what that says to me is that if we continue to uh, court these demographics, these are going to be Democratic voters. And it also tells me that uh, our mes messages as Democrats resonate with demographics that are going to be a key important part. Uh, to, to, this, to elections, uh, not only in midterms, but in, in 2016. I will say, though, that we have to do a better job uh, as a Democratic Party talking to white males and, 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 and talking to them in a way that, uh, that relates uh, to them. Um, but as you can see here, I mean, I think the, the, the turnout for, uh, for these demo, uh, demographics are important. We continue to court them. It's an important part of the Democratic Party uh, that we, um, you know, so much so that we have a constituency uh, uh, outreach person that focuses on this all the, all the time, and, and not only with these demographics, but LGBT, uh, seniors, uh, you know, a number of folks, because we know that we can't take any vote for granted, and we have to make sure that we reach out to every uh, segment of the population. Yeah, but don't you think, I mean, seriously, I'd like to say the Republican Party's growing, but it's not. The Democrat Party's not growing either. The part that's growing is independence. And we're both in the hunt for them, and, and the, African Americans, once Barack Obama is not the historic president anymore, they're going to be up for grabs, some of them. And that's what you're seeing, the first cracks of that. And Hispanics, we took a survey, our, our, we have a Spanish speaking polling company, Pinos Latinas, and we took a survey of 800 Hispanic adults um, last summer, and uh, uh, the summer before it. And even though they think the Republicans don't want them here, they think they're against them, et cetera, um, it, and they have a terrible perception of the Republican Party as a brand. They agree with the Republicans on E-Verify, and not just registered Hispanics, but Hispanic adults. They agree with the Republicans on securing the border first before anybody gets legal status. They agree with the Republicans and, and, um, as, as far as no welfare, no Obamacare, no benefits, taxpayer-funded benefits, until you become a citizen, not just get legal status. And that's the majority of Hispanics. So it becomes about issues and ideas, and going back to the candidates that articulate that, where this is really up for grabs. It's really more volatile and more independent. I'd like to say the Republicans are going to get this. I'm not. I'm just saying they have opportunity. And I think the same is for the Democrats. You have to reclaim your coalition that certainly the president put together that got him elected and reelected. But it's totally up for grabs in this next election in 2016. If Republicans do as well with non-whites in 2016 as they did in 2014, Okay, even adjusting, assuming a 70% non-Hispanic white electorate in uh, 2016, which is, is what trend would be down from 72% in, in 2012, Republicans would win the popular vote by three to four points. Um, that, that, sh that, uh, that shift from 72% Democrat down to 63% among Hispanics and from 96% African Americans down to 89% really adds up. Uh, and it, 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 makes a, it makes a big difference. But, but just on a point of optimism, for Raul, Nathan, and myself, this is a lot of business. We're going to do a lot of polls. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. Job security. <laughs> this is good. I, I, and I, I, I want to hear, I, but I just want to say, you know, I made the point on health care about separating moral versus political. And, and I think if we're going to have a big conversation about demographics, we, we should just all be on the same page. That we're talking like, how do you put together an electorate to get 50% plus one? Morally, I think Republicans, I said, I'm 100% I'm in favor of comprehensive immigration reform. I think Republicans should roll out the red carpet uh, for Hispanics 100%. But in terms of the cold calculus of what do you need to do to get to 50% plus one, you know, 35% of the Hispanic vote probably gets it done for 
of Republicans, and that's an important data point. And by the way, you don't leave out big events. Republicans, we thought we were going to have a coalition back in the 70s, and then you have Watergate. And then Bush raised taxes in 88. We kind of blew our coalition apart. And then, you know, you get the Iraq War, and we blow our coalition apart again. And now you're looking at a world with ISIS and Russia and all these things going on that our best laid plans and processes here kind of get blown up by events. So, sorry, Dan. No, Patrick. that's all right. I, I, um, oh. I, I think there are a couple of key demographics that will tell the tale. One, as Sean says, is what will happen to the Hispanic vote. The interesting thing to me about Republicans and the Hispanic vote is that it's not that there have not been candidates who've been capable of getting 35 or 40 or 42 or, you know, George W. Bush obviously did even better than that in his reelect in 1998. But the, but the absence of consistency on that is, I think, what continues to be the biggest problem for Republicans. It's almost specific candidate dependent as opposed to a party that has been able to get an embrace by a consistent one-third or 38 percent of the Hispanic voters in presidential year. So, so that's one test. And obviously, the candidate makes a difference. But the message overall of the party also makes a difference. And I think that Republicans have put too much confidence in the idea that, that there's this issue where Hispanics agree with this, or there's this value where they agree with this, and not the totality of what the party projects. So that's one question. The second is on the white vote. Um, and I mean, the question I have, if, if, if Secretary Clinton becomes the nominee of the Democratic Party, will she do worse with white voters than Barack Obama has done? Um, and I think that objectively you would probably say no. She will probably do somewhat better. How much better? I don't know. Um, but if she were to, I mean, if, if Democrats were able to move that, that number up among whites who are still going to be 70 percent of the electorate, then that makes a big difference. So those two demographic, demographic pieces to me are the ones to keep watching. On the whites point, um, or non-Hispanic whites, if you start in 1996, which is Bill Clinton's last election, and you control for popular vote, what we call PVI in the business, but basically we, we, we take, the, the, we allow, we take the, the rise and fall of the title pool I was talking about earlier out of it. The, the, the trend line among whites with, from, from Clinton to Gore to Kerry to Obama in 2008 to Obama in 2012 does just what my hand did. It's, it's a straight line <coughs> down. Uh, and if you look at the congressional vote, it does from two, 1996 to 98, it does just what my hand is doing. It goes down. Um, there's more of a sawtooth pattern to it in, in Congress. But, uh, but so even taking the individual candidates out, um, the trend line is almost a straight line uh, downward, which suggests that it really isn't just about Obama. And you can, if you want further evidence of that, you can, you can look at the trend uh, among whites from 2008 to 2012. You can't explain change with the constant, and Obama was on top of the ballot both times. Now, could, Clint, could Clinton reverse that? It's, it's possible. And, and actually, I sort of think it's likely, uh, because she has a unique brand, uh, at least for now. Um, but but I, I also think you have to look at what really is a long-term trend that predates Obama um, and, and have some skepticism about that. Well, I think you also have to split out white males from white females. I mean, the, the data from 2014 from the exit poll in 2010 is amazingly consistent, both in the top line and most of the demographics, except you see the continuation of the gender gap. The gap got four points more. Uh, Republicans did two points better among men than they did four years ago. They did two points worse among women than they did four years ago. The same with white men and white women. The gap is, is big. It was, Democrats only got 33% of the white male vote in these congressional elections, but they got 42% of the white female vote. I would have to think with Hillary as the Democratic nominee and more than likely a white male as the Republican nominee, since there don't seem to be other uh, uh, serious options on the table, that gap is going to increase even more in 2016. This may be a, a total aside uh, or diversion, but uh, it's, we've been focusing a lot on specific demographics, but I guess what I, if, if there's, we've had since 2006, we've had basically big swing elections just about every two years. Democrats 
win 2006, 2008, 2012, Republicans, huge wins 2010, 2014. What's the kind of unifying theme of all these races? It's this deep-seated pessimism that voters have about the country. We've been in the wrong track in our polling since right after George W. Bush was reelected in early 2005. It has not changed. That's an extraordinarily long, we've only been polling since the late 80s, but uh, all of our pollsters who are far smarter and wiser than me seem to suggest that this is a major trend in American politics and that uh, all of these shifts between demographic groups, uh, you know, I feel like as we're looking forward to the next election, the party that can get its hand around that pessimism and present uh, the most plausible argument for, I mean, we did a poll right after the, le the election and uh, three quarters of all voters don't expect Republicans, despite these big wins, they don't expect this new alignment to change anything. Uh, it's almost as if people have really given up on the system and I think whatever the demographic mix is, it's the party that is going to be able to articulate the ideas that are going to give people a little bit of hope is the one that seems like it's going to have the best mm -hmm. chance at uh, competing or winning in 2016. And I just, uh, we keep focusing on these very narrow questions and I think that the questions that voters want politicians to answer are a lot bigger than what comprehensive immigration reform should look like or, you know, whether the minimum wage should be 1150 or 1075 and uh, I don't I'm rambling here but I, I do feel That's like a very good point I, my, my last big and this is on those lines my last bit it goes to something Patrick said and John said and I think this is an ecumenical point that will make us all feel good about each other it, 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 it's that it, the, the reason I ultimately I think the stuff is completely unpredictable is that big stuff comes along all the time and blows things up yep. I mean you know, in 2004, people really did think Republicans were on the, I mean, George Bush had just won between 40 and 45 percent of the Hispanic vote. And it was like, wow, I mean, they, they, they have the catbird seat because at that level they would win forever. And then all of a sudden Iraq doesn't look as good as it did. And then all of a sudden the economy implodes. But the, the, the earlier story I want to say, if we were doing this conference in 1924 or 1925, I guess, uh, and you came to 1924, you came to me and said, Sean, your, your job depends on telling me what's going to happen with demographics over the next few cycles. Okay, okay. I will stake my career on three facts. The South will always be uniformly democratic. African Americans will always be a 90% Republican <coughs> constituency, which they had been going back to the 1860s. And the Democrats are doomed because they had lost northern white Catholic ethnics. Republicans had carried Manhattan two elections in a row. Uh, which would be the equivalent of them carrying Manhattan two elections in a row today. Um, so the Democrats were doomed. And I would be out of a job four years later when the Democrats, and I mean, look, the Democrats had deadlocked in 1924 over whether to, con to con condemn the Ku Klux Klan. Okay, this was not, this was not, that their convention went to like 198 ballots because of this issue. This was not a coalition that looked like it was going to pick up Catholics or minorities. Um, and yet I'd be out of a job in 1928 because lo and behold, they nominate Al Smith and white Catholics vote Democrat uh, for the next, 20, uh, the next 20 years. And in 1936, because the New Deal raises all boats, including African Americans economically for the first time, governments reaching out to help them, Demo African Americans become a 70% Democratic constituency. Herbert Hoover is actually the last Republican to carry African Americans in 1932. And the South begins to move towards uh, Republicans because African Americans enter the Democratic coalition. And in 1956, Dwight Eisenhower is the first Republican to carry uh, the Southern vote. So these things are, are always in flux and there are always big things that make it really, really, really difficult to predict more than, I mean, even four years out is hard, but, but I think 20 years out is impossible. Okay, I wanna move to my next topic, which is getting into the 26th election. And my first question is on the Democratic side, and, and the first part of it I think is, is fairly uh, easy to respond to. Uh, the second part is a little trickier, so let me try to word this as well as I can. Will Secretary Clinton run? And the second piece of the question is, would, will she get a primary? Not that we'll threaten her nomination from someone like Jim Webb, 
but that will prove to be a draining primary that will keep her involved in a nomination fight longer and detract from her ability to wage a general election campaign like, say, Romney's fights wound up being. Will she run and will she get a, a challenge that hurts? Yeah. That hurts. Um, so are you trying to get me in trouble? No. <laughs> I actually didn't address the question to you, Raul. So. <laughs> you're you're, you're waiting in you yourself. Did say that. You did say that. Uh, look, I, I, look I, it's, I think it's still early. Um, we have no indication uh, at, at this point as to whether or not she will do it. Um, you know, I mean, most people say she will. Um, but at the Democratic Party, we uh, generally and don't get involved in, in primaries um, because we like the process to, to play out and we want everybody to have the opportunity to, to, to run their race and, and, and go through the course. Um, will I, and, you know, is there going to be candidates that are going to get into this that will help, you know, move uh, the conversation to, to the left or to the middle or to the right? Absolutely there will be. Um, who those candidates are, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I think the process will take its course, and, and at the end of the day, we're going to have a nominee, I think, that will, that will be a candidate that's going to be uh, a great candidate for the 2016 presidential election. And his company face on. <laughs> <laughs> She's definitely going to run. The interesting part about inside the Democrat Party, the progressive wing is about to go to war with a pragmatic moderate wing, and there's all sorts of subsets of that. You'll see it in the primaries. But, you know, 2007, if we sat here in that conference, like Sean saying, if we look back, 2007, we'd be saying, oh, it's Giuliani Clinton. The only thing that's changed is Rudy's not in the race, and she went down like the Titanic to a guy that we didn't know named Barack Obama um, in, in, in 2008. And the only thing that's really changed is, I don't know who the next Obama is, but she's eight years older. And I'm not sure, you know, it would take a lot at, at, for the Democrats, and the Democrats are acting like the Republican establishment. We normally have a front runner, and we're going to protect that front runner and make that person the next president. And uh, um, I'm not sure that works in the Democrat Party. So I'd be, I think she's going to run because there's so much at stake and they're invested in her. But I don't think she's going to be the nominee. I think she, it could be an ambush. That's nice. I don't see who's going to ambush her. I mean, uh, you know, I, we'll see. Um, <laughs> I mean, and yes, compared, even compared to 2007, she's. 30 points ahead of where she was running within the Democratic Party in 2007. And there were a former vice presidential uh, nominee. You know, Barack Obama, as unknown as he was nationally, was considered a rising star. You had other people in that race. I, I don't think she's going to be seriously challenged. And I think it would actually help her if she were seriously challenged. I think. It, By the way, it, I thought Elizabeth Warren was brilliant last night on TV. <laughs> I, I just really thought she was. But I, do you really think uh, uh, another woman in the I, Democratic Party is going to challenge? I think she ought to regulate her? every bank and paycheck in America. I think she'd do a great job. I, no. I, I think she's obviously going to, I think she's going to run. Uh, but, I, I, and I think she probably will get a challenge of some kind. And I don't necessarily think it's going to be a challenge from someone necessarily particularly strong, because frankly, I don't think there's anyone else particularly strong out there at this point. But, but what I'll say is this, is that uh, we in the media have built up such high expectations for Hillary Clinton. Uh, and, and, and when you build up high expectations for, 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 for anyone, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be impossible for them to meet them. And so, you know, she's going to make a mistake. Or she's going to trip over herself. And she already has. I mean, she, she's fumbled the ball on a, on, a, on a few occasions. And then when, whenever she does it, we in the media, you know, uh, you know we, uh, we highlight it, right? And so the, the problem that she's going to have is she's going to slip and fall. Uh, a few times, and 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 she, when she slips and falls, she's going to slip and fall about a thousand miles, and 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 it's going to create this impression of more of a horse race in the primary uh, than there probably really is than there probably really is. But that's that's the history of Hillary Clinton as well. I mean, her she's had peaks and valleys, and when she's out of the political arena, her popularity grows. When she climbs back into the political arena, her her popularity. I mean. The more she ran right. in, in 2008, the lower she went. The moment she became Secretary of State and was out of the political arena, her popularity went right back up. But, but I think Alex so. has, a, has a good point. Um, I mean, she, can't, she probably cannot match the expectations that she'll have. Her strongest opponent will be those expectations and not necessarily some other candidate unless someone <coughs> catches fire in a way that you know, would, it's hard to predict at this point. I think one question is, will she look like a stronger candidate at the end of the nomination process um, or by 
by the late spring of 2016, if she's a candidate, than she does at the beginning. Um, and, and how will the country see her at that point as opposed to how they see her at the beginning? Um, the book tour did not go well, um, and the degree to which she has those kinds of moments will only reinforce the question of, or, or add to the question of, is she as prepared for this as, as uh, everybody thinks? I mean, she obviously, I mean, we know all the attributes, but, um, but she's not been a nimble or uh, agile pre-candidate candidate, candidate uh, in this early period. Well, the cracks for her are all going to be in the general election. I, I really don't see the cracks in the primary. We, we asked in the exit poll, do you think nationally, do you think Hillary Clinton would make a good president? Only 42 percent of the electorate this year thought she'd make a good candidate. 50, uh, president, 53 percent said no. But you look within the Democratic Party, 81 percent said she would be a good candidate. No one in the Republican side even was above 50 percent among their own party. So I, I don't think the cracks are within the Democratic Party. I'm not if saying she runs. I'm not I saying think. that she's going to have a if she runs that she's she's going to have a serious challenge for the nomination. Um, but you know, no non-incumbent has ever had the kind of nomination right. contest that she may face, which is a I mean, you know. So no, I, I think contest. actually, how does she, she how does she sustain? Uh, you know, a how how does she get herself truly tuned up for a general election under those kinds of circumstances. How does she, she sustain herself? How does she spend her time? Um, to what extent does she engage with her opponents or not? How often does she debate? Does she try to avoid debates? I mean, there are a whole lot of questions that she's got to answer uh, given the, the early structure of this nomination. No, I, think, I think she would benefit from a challenge like the Bill Bradley challenge to Al Gore in 2000. I mean, Bill Bradley didn't win a primary or a caucus, um, but Bill, uh, Al Gore had to take him seriously. I think she would, I don't see her, foresee her even losing one primary or caucus, but I think it would help her to have a challenge like that for her to exercise her, uh, her political uh, 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 performance. Okay, let's go to the other side, which is, uh, I think, infinitely more difficult. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to ask the question this way and see if anybody has a response. Does anyone have a theory of how one or two or three of these Republicans could win the nomination? Or anybody that you see out there that you know has a leg up? I want to ask you who's going to win because nobody's going to want to answer that question, but. Well, I mean, I think the defining feature of this field is that it is just unbelievably unpredictable. I mean, it's like 31 flavors of candidates. There's kind of a fla there's a candidate for every, uh, every taste, and it's hard to look right now and say, I mean, you know, we <coughs> tend to say, you know, you put the social conservatives here, you kind of put the moderates here, uh, there's the Tea Party wing here. Well, in each of those three main lanes, there's a crowd of candidates competing for voters in each, and it's really tough to know at this point who the dominant player is going to be in each of those lanes. I mean, Mitt Romney benefited by the fact, which seems to be a constant trend in Republican primaries, is that the conservative lane tends to be the most crowded, so they just kind of they chop each other's votes up, or at least in recent history. And I mean, Romney in 2008 tried to be the conservative candidate, and he just he got too much competition from Mike Huckabee and others. Uh, I think this year we we because we don't entirely know who's going to run uh, the that kind of moderate wing could attract three or four highly credible candidates. So it's not. I think the party tends to nominate that moderate candidate because he or she, usually he, or I guess in all cases he, has had the least competition. And um, I, just, I, I really, I have, I have no idea. I think it's, uh, it's going to be really up and down. I think everyone's going to be kind of grouped together. I don't think it's going to be like 2010 where we kind of saw Romney here and people kind of rise and fall as the Romney alternative. I do think it's going to be whoever can kind of grind it out. Uh, and I think it, it could be long and I think it also could be hugely beneficial for the Republican Party because I think 2008 we wrote about how contentious the Democratic primary was uh, for President Obama but, and Hillary Clinton, but it also forced them to energize a party base in places that they had never gone before and for a time, I think a lot of it's receded, but for a time I think they were able to uh, build an infrastructure that the party had just never had before. 
I'll, I'll throw something out there that I don't know if I'd predict it will happen, but I think there's a good chance of it. Uh, and maybe it's because I wrote about there being a chance of it in 2012 and it didn't happen, but it came a lot closer than people think. Um, and that's the possibility that, that this, you want to know how it's decided. My answer is it's decided at the Republican convention because no one has a majority of the delegates by then. Um, I did, just kind of as a thought experiment, I, uh, I took someone's list of, of Repu they had a list of 26 Republicans who were, had been bandied about as contenders, and I took the people that I thought there was a pretty good chance that they would run, uh, and then I jotted down what I thought was kind of a bare minimum, like, okay, there's no way that Jeb Bush falls below 15% in Iowa. You can't have that much money in name recognition to do worse than that. And I had a bunch of people at like 2 and 3%. And then I added it up, and it added up to 146%, <laughs> um, which I wasn't a math major, but I'm pretty sure that won't happen. Uh, and and so the, the takeaway from this, though, is that you, know, you could win Iowa with 10 or 15% of the vote. I mean, conceivably, and if there's 10 legitimate Republicans running, that's probably what will do it. And, and who can get 10%, 15% of the vote in Iowa? A whole bunch of people. Well, then you go immediately to New Hampshire, which is like, you know, has tended to sort of be establishment central. And then you go to South Carolina, which, you know, went for uh, Gingrich. So it's kind of more of a Tea Party place now that the upcountry Democrats are Republicans. You go to Florida, which is Bush or Rubio. And these are like, you know, bam, bam, bam. You have Nevada, uh, which is a caucus, which is kind of unpredictable. Well, again, you could win these with <coughs> 20, 25 percent. And then you go to Super Tuesday which, you know, if you have these Republicans who incidentally are from, are geographically dispersed, they could all pick off two states or so. Now you say, well, they won't all stick around that long. Well, who would have seen Newt Gingrich sticking around until April? And in the old campaign finance system, it wouldn't have happened. But in the super PAC world, uh, your, your money line doesn't necessarily run dry. Uh, you can keep going a lot longer than you possibly could. And, and so I think there's a real possibility that by the time the field really starts to winnow, these other 10 candidates have enough delegates sewn up that, that they're brokers when they get to the Republican convention. Uh, and it came in 2012, if Rick Santorum had run about a point and a half better in Michigan and a half point better in Ohio, there would have been a broken convention, a brokered convention in 2012. Um, and anyone could have come out, out of it. So it came close in 2012. This is a much stronger field in 2016, and I think it's a real possibility. And the schedule the Republicans have pushed for 2016 even makes it more likely, because it looks like the four early events are going to be in February, and then there's going to be a huge Super Tuesday on March 1st. That's not a lot of time to shake out eight or ten candidates down to three, two or three main choices by Super Tuesday. So I don't, and that shakeout may not happen until after Super Tuesday, and by then more than half the delegates may have been selected. Maybe I'm just rooting for that because our clicks will yes. go through the roof. But uh. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that? Anybody want to throw out an, an idea or a concept? Well, if I can just add, I think the two most important words that came while we were talking about were legitimate and credible. And we've got so many candidates that fit that billing this year. Um, without naming names, I think we could all agree that that wasn't necessarily the case in the 2012 <laughs> uh, primary process. And yet, as you mentioned, there was Romney over here, and a lot of people would rise and fall as the alternative. And I think we're underestimating the willingness of the Republican primary electorate in this type of situation to consider people. Um, there is a necessity in the, with this electorate to shock the system to a certain extent. Um, I don't necessarily have a prediction on who can do that, but the people who are able to do that early, um, I think before we even get to the primary process, there is a potential to see some separation uh, within this field, not necessarily because one candidate is stronger than the other or performs better than the other, but there is sort of a, uh, there's a Hollywood mentality to it. You know, so these guys become celebrities on the campaign trail. They become celebrities, I should say men and women become celebrities, because um, I imagine we'll have a couple this time around. Uh, and going into the first nominating process, regardless of who wins or loses, keep in mind the importance of the momentum of the perception that Romney won in Iowa, even though when they finished counting, you know, it wasn't that he got the delegates, delegates, it's that he got launched to a certain extent into this primary process. And a lot of that was built before we got to the first vote being cast. Um, I would be terrified to have to deal with the brokered convention <laughs> as somebody who would probably have to be there dealing with it. 
Um, and it's certainly a possibility with all these legitimate candidates, but unlike in 2012 where we saw a candidate shock the system, jump to the front, and then immediately be dismantled by the media, we have the potential for somebody to jump to the front and stay there. Um, a lot of these guys can back up what they're saying as opposed to falling apart under debates or intense questioning or any of these other sorts of things. I also think we're going to see the primary process change. There's been a lot of talk of this on the Republican side to have less debates, less focus on the type of situation where our guys can get picked apart. Um, what this means is if you're able to make that jump, there's less opportunities to stumble early on in the process. Um, so I, if we get to the first vote being cast and we still have 10 people who are each polling at 5%, you know, very much I could see this playing out, but I'd be very surprised if we didn't have three to four candidates who have semi-separated from the field before the first vote is even cast. I mean, people want somebody to get excited about. This is what the Republican primary electorate was kind of saying in 12 before they, you know, it just kind of came down to how the votes split. But they want to be excited about somebody that somebody just has to be able to back up what they're selling. I think a lot of our guys can do that this time. Okay. I have one last question, and then we'll go to Q&A. Uh, as those of you who attend our programs often uh, hopefully uh, know, I really try to be very fair in my questions. So <laughs> I'm just going to say up front that this following question is extremely unfair <laughs> and is really putting all of these uh, uh, gentlemen on the spot. Uh, but I did warn them I was going to ask them this. So I get a few, uh, a few points on that. Patrick, I want to start with you. Who will be the next president? And why do you think that? <laughs> You're going that way, right? <laughs> no. Uh, well, then I guess I get to be the first person to say I have no idea as my uh, initial caveat. Uh, I think a lot of it is going to depend on what are the factors that determine the election. I think uh, just taking Hillary, let's presume she's the nominee, which seems likely. Um, it, of, in an entirely unpredictable election, the most likely thing is that Hillary will be the Democratic nominee. I think the thing that she can't do is be new because she's such a known brand. So therefore, if they're going to run a winning campaign, it will have to be about confidence, which, you know, you look at any poll, that's the one attribute that seems to be very consistent, a consistent positive for her is that people, whether they like her or not, think that she can do the job. So if it's about small things and we're dealing with overseas threats and the economy's you know chugging along and it's not kind of the 2008 uh, historic moment election I think she's got a pretty good shot I think weighing on her is that there's just what no matter what the economy does it's really hard to to as hard as it is to win the White House for a party out of power I think it's equally hard for a party in power to hold it uh, just because you are kind of the receptacle for all of the resentments. Maybe what's going to help her is the fact that Republicans control Congress. Um, but I think, you know, you can see scenarios whereby she grinds it out and wins. Republicans, I don't know who the nominee is going to be. You know, I could throw out names arbitrarily, but I think that if that candidate can be new and can present a vision that makes people feel kind of good about the country again, and it's a, an election on bigger themes, which truthfully has not been the Republican Party's strength in recent history. And I think there are a number of candidates in there who can do it. Chris Christie, Marco Rubio, um, you know, Rand Paul is, I think there are impediments for him winning the, the primary, but I think that he is talking about bigger things. Uh, then I think that person could win, and I would probably bet on that person. And if you really want me to throw a name out, I mean, I. Uh, I guess I'll say Chris Christie because he's kind of got that star quality and he has the presidential ability to deflect difficult questions by saying something that sounds good but really means nothing at all. So, <laughs> Okay, good. It took a while, but you got around to an answer. Well, That's you know, good, I, yeah. <laughs> I had to couch it. I'm, I'm going to have to cover the thing, so I okay. don't need people. No, that's, that's very helpful. Let's move a little briskly, though, so we leave time for Q&A. John? Well, I think since we're at Kansas... I think what we should do is change the Republican primary system because we're going to have over 20 candidates. Be like the NCAA yeah. playoffs, <laughs> where we have regionals, <laughs> and you get to you know you get to pick and face off because it's really hard to pick like how this is going to go. The bank shots because it's first of all the timing, the ricochets. I mean, you saw it where remember back in '96, Senator Dole Forbes was within three points within 12 days, we're in fourth place. 
and you guys wouldn't, you know. So it's like things really matter. But I think if you look at all the candidates, and I work with a bunch, and you can see a role where people I've worked for in the past, and you got these long shots like even Pete King, Jim Gilmore, thinking of running, and you get people like, uh, you know, Huckabee I've worked with in these things, and he had, he's won Iowa before. But of the candidates I know that I've worked for in the past, if he gets into it, it would be Jeb Bush. Because Jeb, Jeb is, regardless of what the polls say right now, if you work with the guy, he knows his facts, he's a policy wonk, and he's also a genuinely nice, sincere, honest guy. So I really think, and he knows what, if, if he decides to get into this, he may decide not to run because he knows what's involved. But if he gets into this, he's the type of candidate that will win, and he's also the type of candidate that could go all the way and win the whole thing. So. Okay, Dan. I thought you were going to say George Pataki. <laughs> <laughs> Don't under the, look, look, they laughed when he was mayor of Peekskill, and he said he'd be governor, and he's the go he became governor in New York. I wouldn't underestimate him. I mean, there's a lot of good candidates here that you can't estimate. There's a whole bunch of Midwestern governors that are really good. So it's like Republicans, as, as Nathan said, we've got a lot better crew. The problem is we've got too many of them. <laughs> Bill, I don't know, and I wouldn't hazard a prediction. Um, partly for the reason that Patrick said, as somebody who's going to cover this race, I'm not going to try to prejudice either my reporting or uh, how people perceive it. Um, I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> <laughs> it may not be. be I'm waiting for Bill's follow-up. Okay. Uh, but, um, you know, I think there are a couple of questions that have to be answered. One is, the person with the clearest path is obviously Hillary Clinton. But there are enough questions about her to begin with, and then there are going to be questions about where the country is at that point and how, uh, what kind of an appetite there is for a third term of the Democrats, whether you call it the third Obama term or, or not. But um, so, uh, how popular will President Obama be will have a big effect on whether the Democrat can win. I, I think for the, re the the Republican nominee and and. It is as wide open a field as you know, we've ever seen. Um, I think the question is, who can present the Republican Party in the most appealing light possible? Um, this has not been done for several cycles of the Republican, among the Republican nominees. Um, the, the nomination process will, will prove who's capable of doing that. Um, and. Um, I would say beyond that, the, the larger question for both the Democratic and the Republican nominee will be who can, who can in a persuasive way, uh, tell people that they have both a formula and the leadership capability to make the system work. And if somebody has a persuasive case that they can make on that, uh, they will have a leg up in the general election. Okay, Raul. And I'm going to stay on message, and um, <laughs> we, we, you know we're, we, we're going to put up a good uh, host of candidates, and you know we're going to let the pr uh, primary play out, and uh, whoever comes out of that, we uh, will definitely be supportive of. There's a lot of risk in going first here. <laughs> uh, there is. I, I probably would ask the question differently now, but it's too late. Right? <laughs> well, first of all, whoever the Republican nominee is. They will beat Hillary Clinton in the general election. I'm going to use that YouTube clip for my job applications next year. <laughs> um, but that said, uh, so for me, and I do truly believe that for a number of reasons, including the fact that I think the underperformance for Democrats in these big elections with men and specifically white men is right now double the size of what they're getting out of what they consider battleground demographics, like the independent white woman or the Hispanic vote that we talked about earlier, which for various reasons I do think are coming up for grabs in some ways, as John talked about. But the bottom line is that they aren't, if we're fighting over these demographics that Democrats need to win by 20 or 30 points to make up a deficit that they're starting with, and both sides are focused on these demographics, they might win there, but not by the margins they're gonna need. And the short version is that's why I think the Republican nominee, especially when you think about the newness of a candidate, uh, much as Pat was saying, but in the Republican primary, this guessing game, I think there's a lot. I'm not gonna just list the names of everybody I'd prefer to work for, but <laughs> I will say that I think the most interesting case and one of the longer shots, um, I don't necessarily think that this is going to happen, but I think it's the most interesting candidate to consider is Rand Paul. 
Um, and one of the reasons is because in that general election, when you talk about potentially loosening up 10% of the younger African American vote, I mean, he's the Republican who's talking about big issues and reaching out directly to that community. Um, and the flip side of that that I was considering up until recently is this new budding kind of security coalition that John talked about earlier, which was kind of a problem for Rand until he started talking differently about ISIS recently. Um, I don't know if that, what that's being motivated by, but when you become a serious voice on those issues and kind of address that wing of the Republican Party and you have this newness, I also think he's consistently going to be underperforming in the polls what he'll do on election day throughout the primary process. I think he'll bring a lot of new people into the process that when you have to pay for every phone number and every phone call, a lot of the media polls, you know, you have to cut corners somewhere and they're going to buy a list of phone numbers of people who have voted in the Republican presidential primary in the past. And when they call those people, they're going to miss a lot of Rand Paul voters. So I think for a lot of reasons, this could be the most interesting candidacy to keep an eye on. I think there are a lot of other strong candidates. There are probably other stronger candidates, some of whose names have comes up have come up, but I think that's certainly the most interesting one to watch, and I think it would certainly be the most dynamic general election demographically when you think about the constituencies that we're now fighting for, when you think about some of the minority constituencies um, that have been talked about as kind of locked down for the next 20 years by some people, not necessarily by this panel, but uh, it could be really fascinating to watch. Alex? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would have to say that uh, Hillary Clinton's the favorite to win. Does that give you a little bit more cover now? <laughs> it does, it does. Um, and I, I, I agree, I think, I think Rand Paul is sort of, he's kind of starting to be underrated a little bit as we start talking more and more about Jeb Bush and uh, some of the other folks, but, but don't underestimate him, I think. Joe? Yeah. I, well, if Hillary runs, she'll be the nominee, and then the question is, in the general election, which wing of the Republican Party gets the nominee. I, I would agree. I think Rand Paul is well positioned to be in the final two of that. But I would think there's too much at stake and that the establishment, more less conservative wing of the party, would try to, to, to stop him and co um, coalesce around someone, whether it's Jeb Bush or Chris Christie. And I think that would be a fascinating race that's going to go to June, a Rand Paul versus an establishment race I think would be as fascinating as the, the Hillary Clinton-Obama race was in 2008. And I think the way the schedule is set up, the way the thing's going to shake out, I think Rand Paul's in the final two and it's who, who can challenge him. And then I'm going to give myself a couple of possibilities. I think if it's Rand Paul that holds on, I think Hillary Clinton will beat him for the establishment reasons and the security reasons and the confidence and the lack of um, wanting to risk change. But if it's an establishment candidate like Jeb Bush, <laughs> I think Hillary Clinton's advantages go away. So I'm going to give you a couple options. Uh, that's <laughs> okay, the way I enough. see it path out. John? Uh, Hillary Clinton wins with 52% of the two-party vote, plus or minus 7%. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, look, if I could predict economic growth, I wouldn't be here. I'd be on, with all due respect, I'd be on a yacht somewhere hot. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but, yeah, I, I think a recession right now, because of how deep the valley was, a recession in the next couple of years doesn't seem likely. Go short now because the stock market will drop a thousand points on Monday now that I've said that. But we have a tightening job market. Um, that's going to help with real disposable income. People will feel richer. Gas prices are dropping, et cetera. Um, so I think the fundamentals do point to a close race, but I'm not a fundamentals fundamentalist. Uh, and I think when you look at the candidate qualities. I mean, I, I think Hillary Clinton has a strong brand. I think she, after 12 years of just, well, 16 years at that point, the Americans just kind of being exhausted with their presidents. And I don't just mean bored with them. I mean, like, it's been an exhausting time with two controversial presidents. She can kind of point back. She can do Harding in 1920, a return to normalcy. Like, look, the last time the Clintons had the White House, it was pretty darn good. Um, and, and I think that's kind of what the American people crave. I don't in any way right off the possibility that she could be substantially stronger than whites, with whites than Barack Obama and even Kerry, because I think there's still some residual goodwill in greater Appalachia towards the Clintons. And, and I think there is a real chance that the Republican Party tears itself apart. I mean, the idea that Scott Walker wins Iowa, Chris Christie wins New Hampshire, Ted Cruz in South Carolina, Florida to Bush or Rubio, and then along the way, Rand Paul it just picks off random caucuses every now and again, because he only needs to get 500 people there to win. 
uh, is not at all fanciful. Um, and, and you can just see the, the, the blueprint for Republican self-immolation there. I, I think at the end of the day, the big problem for Republicans is twofold. They, they did a lot of what Republicans get elected to do in the 80s and 90s, and it hasn't been reversed. Uh, and that included destroying the Soviet Union. And they just haven't found, you know, they haven't found a new board to put the three-legged stool back again. Uh, the, this upcoming divided primary, I think, is really more a symptom of that than anything else. And I think it's going to cause problems in the general election. Okay, time for Q&A. I want to move through this very quickly. Uh, raise your hand and get uh, Quinn or Zach's attention. Uh, please ask one very brief question. And panelists, please, let's just have one or two brief answers to it so we can do as many as we can. Go for it, Zach. There was recently an article on Politico, actually, that discussed how the presidency can sometimes be damaging to a party, kind of like we saw recently in the 2014 elections where people voted against Obama. Do you think um, that, that will, it will make it harder for the Republicans to win in 2016, given the majority? I mean, I, it's a good question. I, I think that the, the fact that Republicans now uh, uh, own Capitol Hill uh, it's kind of a problem for them, right? Because you know, you, you look at look at exit polling here, and as much as voters uh, dislike the president, uh, they dislike uh, Congress even more. And so now Republicans are going to have to own that. You're going to have this other added dynamic here, assuming Hillary does run, which is that she's going to be under a lot of pressure to distance herself from uh, the White House on, on on a lot of issues, right? And I think that what you saw with, with Schumer uh, coming out after the midterms. Uh, and, and criticizing health, uh, the president on health care and, and saying it was, you know, it was a problem for the, for the party in and, and, and the midterms. What he was really doing was he was start, starting to create an avenue for, for other people in his party, Hillary included, uh, to start distancing themselves from Hillary and to sort of try to uh, turn the page on her a little bit. Uh, and so, so Democrats, assuming it's Hillary, are going are gonna to be distancing themselves uh, from the White House. And then you're going to have uh, whoever the Republican is, assuming it's not a member of Congress uh, as the Republican nominee, is going to be under pressure potentially to distance themselves from uh, Republicans on, on, on Capitol Hill. And you know, as we saw just this week, there's still a ton of dysfunction uh, on, 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 on Capitol Hill. Republicans are going to own it. There was almost a, a government shutdown last night, right? So. Uh, Republicans it, it winning control of the House and Senate, sort of a double-edged sword for them. Okay, next question. Uh, do you think uh, ideas or demographics will be the determining factor in the uh, upcoming election? No. <laughs> you know what? I, 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 think, I, think the, I think the economy is going to be the overwhelming factor uh, with demographics and ideas playing tertiary roles, to be honest. I would say ideas come about because of the demographics. And then when a lot of times our leaders, you know, see what's going on and they come up with a good idea and all of a sudden people are already there and they support it. So then it, it just, it basically percolates that way. So it's both. The ideas come about, demographics fall behind it, and then the ideas carry the election. The message is really important. Yeah, you, people vote for a reason. And whether they're not voting or whether they show up that day, it's because you're going to do something for them that they think is important. So uh, uh, a candidate without a message is, is not going not to win the election. You need, you, we need the new ideas. We need the messages. OK, do we have another question right here? A couple of you mentioned Chris Christie. Do you think that the Bridgegate scandal and other scandals are going to affect his bid for a presidency? I mean, I guess I was the first to throw his name out. I think it, it can. I think the bigger issue for him is the state of New Jersey and the fact that they have, are in such fiscal straits right now. Uh, it kind of takes away. A lot of the governors are going to be running on the confidence of their record, and I think that it becomes a big uh, a detriment for him. That said, I mean, I think his candidacy would be more based in kind of this celebrity ethos that we've already talked about than uh, actual substance, which I don't mean as a slight against him, but I just think like the, the decision-making rubric for all these guys is very different. And for him, he's been able to kind of create a uh, persona independent of his uh, actual governance. So yeah, someone uh, that lives in New Jersey, I've seen that close hand um, and it plays in New Jersey, but I 
really don't think it plays in an Iowa electorate or a South Carolina electorate. It comes across, I think, as very belligerent, and I don't, yeah. I don't see a Midwest electorate, you know, in Iowa or a Southern electorate in South Carolina wanting someone that belligerent to represent them. Yeah, I mean, it's a big question for him. I have, I have no idea. I would add on the Bridgegate side of it that in a Republican primary, being able to say the mainstream media lobbed false accusations at me now that this report has come out <laughs> is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it may have hurt for a minute, but it happened early enough. He's able to move past it. He showed his fundraising prowess as the head of the RGA, I believe, doubled in his first three months there, the previous three-month record. Um, so I think it far from knocked him out at this point. Other things may, but I don't think it was Bridgegate. Although in terms of entertainment value, a Rand Paul versus Chris Christie <laughs> is, is by far the most yeah. entertaining Clicks. one. Clicks. Throw, throw yes. Ted Cruz into that too. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's not throw Ted Cruz. Uh. <laughs> Do anybody else have a question? Okay. What's the difference between policy and politics? There isn't always one. Yeah. Um, ideally, the difference um, is that some things you just have to get done. I think the most recent example of that was in 2009. Some things just had to get done regardless of the cost. There was an acknowledgement that there is a political cost to taking these votes. They happened anyhow. I don't particularly like the votes that I'm referring to, so I'm not talking about good <laughs> policy here. Um, but you, especially, we talked earlier about the 24-hour news, and that plays to the bases as we talked about, but the loudest people sometimes are the most influential, <clears throat> unfortunately, in this process. And separating the two, frankly, is impossible, even though it shouldn't be. Sometimes one takes precedence over the other, but I think the idea that they exist in separate worlds is a total fallacy within our system. Yeah, I think uh, uh, good policy makes good politics and good politics makes good policy. The, the classic example of the disparity is TARP. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's any TARP doubters here. We were about 72 to 96 hours away from a barter economy, and I'm not being hyperbole. It's not hyperbole. Um, re Republicans did not get sent to Washington to bail out banks, and God knows Democrats didn't get sent to Washington to bail out Wall Street but it just needed to get done. It was terrible politics, especially for Republicans. I think it probably ended up costing them some Senate seats because of enthusiasm among the base. It, it just had to get done. It birthed the Tea Party movement, which has had massive uh, costs down the road for Republicans, but it, it just had to get done. Okay, next question. How likely is another Romney run? <laughs> I, don't I don't have think, any don't coins, we could toss one. Um, the degree to which there's interest in him now, I think, is a function of the lack of clarity with the rest of the field. And if that begins to shake out, um, as Nathan said, we, should, we could or should begin to see some separation sometime during 2015. Then you have a different dynamic and people begin to focus on those people who seem to be making progress and, and they think less about Mitt Romney. Um, he has not firmly closed the door on it. Um, I think only in part because, you know, if there's a crack up within the party in late 2015 or something, there might be great pressure on him to, to come back in. But I don't think it's anything he actively seeks at this point, though people around him are getting calls all the time to try to encourage him to do it. I think the great irony, too, with this whole storyline is that as someone who spent a year covering all the people that Republicans wanted to run other than Mitt Romney, like Chris Christie and Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush. Now these guys all look like they're running and everyone wants Romney, which it just seems like a bit of a disconnect to me. Yeah. I think goes to Dan's point. I don't know how many of you saw the, the documentary behind the scenes of the Romney campaign, but at the end of that documentary, Ann and Mitt Romney did not look like two people that wanted to go through that again. So that, that's just my sense. Okay. Unfortunately, we're out of time here, so we're going to ask one last question right here with Zach. I'd like to know if uh, Obama were white, would the Republican Congress be beating up uh, on that person as much as they have as uh, currently exists? We don't have a God's eye world of views, so we don't know counterfactuals. I mean, I said that like 
many times, and it's my big cop out. But like, what, what did Republicans do with the last white Democratic president? They impeached him. I mean, they, they, they were not <laughs> nice to Bill Clinton. K. Bailey Hutchinson gave a speech at the Republican National Convention and calling him, I don't remember the list, but draft dodging, pot smoking, womanizing, I mean, just this list of horrible expletives. They opposed him on just about everything except when he was trying to implement the Republican agenda with tax cuts and NAFTA and welfare reform. Um, you know, I, 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 maybe his race, had, I think in the election, uh, his race probably dropped his percentages among whites a couple points, just like it probably boosted him from, say, 93% among African Americans to 96%. Uh, but, but ultimately, at the end of the day, he was a Democratic president, and Republicans were going to rip into him no matter what, especially once he went below 50% approval. Anybody else want to comment? Okay. Um, I want to thank the audience for participating. Uh, We've lost a few of you over the course of the, the uh, two days, but we appreciate all of you sticking it out to the end here with us. It, uh, I think it's been very insightful in it, to the end, and I want you to join me in thanking our panelists for a great two days of discussions.